Mr. Fred Dunn. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm pretty good. Do you want to play 20 questions? Sure. Let me stop getting some of my B-reel here. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> First question, Fred or Frederick? You can call me Fred. You have a clear passion for education, Fred. Where do you get this passion from? Uh, I've always liked uh, knowing information that was valuable to others, so I thought uh, becoming a teacher would be a great path for that. And uh, finding something somebody wants to know and that you enjoy sharing about, that's probably the biggest part of it. And then uh, it's exciting to see someone when the light bulb goes on and they figure something out that you've shared. And maybe you can accelerate them down the way a little bit on something they wanted to know. Cool. Where did your YouTube journey start? The YouTube journey uh, started, I made my first YouTube video back in 2008. And uh, it doesn't take very long for you to figure out that YouTube's a good format for sharing a lot of information that people can access over and over through the years. So I originally did it just to help out a friend so I could like their video. And uh, once I did that, I thought, well, I might as well make my own content. So I started doing chicken videos and the Australian emu, and uh, it just went from there. And now, of course, honeybees. You've published over 1,000 videos on YouTube. Is that true? Uh, it seems that way. <laughs> okay. Which single one is your favorite? Oh, I don't have a single favorite um, video on YouTube. Um, when it comes to the standouts, of course, are those where you got some sequences or some footage that uh, was just a matter of being in the right place at the right time with the right equipment. So if we're talking specifically about the bees, I would say the inside the hive um, video that I made, which shows the queen laying, you've got bees grooming, we've got a queen piping. So it kind of covers the full spectrum of the behavior inside a beehive, including making bee bread, putting away nectar, capping, uh, wax production, that. So it kind of was a full circle video, I think is probably my favorite if I had to pick one related to honeybees. What does the typical day look like for Fred Dunn? Typical day, well, my wife is my scheduler for starters, so there's somebody you don't wanna make angry. Uh, and uh, she tells me early in the morning kind of what I'm doing day by day. Some things I know ahead of time, of course, every Friday, I'm doing a question and answer video for YouTube. And uh, during the week, I do a lot of photography because I'm a professional photographer. I do some cinematographic work as well. And my wife does all that scheduling, so people reach out to her. And uh, so I get up like anybody else, see what the weather's doing, and think about how it's going to impact my ability to take someone's pictures or do something maybe with the honeybees that day. You have a very calm presence. How important is that when working with the bees? Uh, not just bees, but any animals. So that's the other thing. I've dealt with all kinds of animals as a photographer, and of course I've always been interested in life sciences. So I think my calm manner and not being afraid and not creating that nervous energy, uh, putting that out, I think actually makes uh, other animals give you a really positive response. You're nervous, you get on a horse, that horse is nervous. You'll soon find yourself kissing the ground, for example. Uh, when it comes to honeybees too, people that are uh, nervous and afraid when they get near bees, what do they do? They talk a lot, they move a lot, they're animated, their movements are jerky. All of these things get the wrong kind of attention from a bee, uh, where if you walk up and you're calm and deliberate and you're there just to observe, then you have more time to interact. And you can kind of think of that where we're in nature right now. So if you walked into these woods back here, you'll find that the woods fall silent. And the more activity, the more moving around that you do, the more it will remain silent. But if you want to see what's really going on, sit still, be calm, and become an observer. And that's true when it comes to beekeeping. Awesome. All right, rapid fire. Coffee or tea? Coffee any day. Photos or videos? Oh man, that's a tough one. If I had to choose between the two, I'm gonna go photography. Chickens or bees? Oh, bees, easy. Chickens or dullards. <laughs> you know your audience. <laughs> what is your favorite invention in the bee industry in the last decade? In the last decade, my favorite invention? That's kind of not fair. 
Uh, I know that my wife is going to say it's the flow hive just because of the way you can get honey straight from a flow frame, frame by frame, and separate the honey that way, and there's no big mess afterwards. So that's kind of within the last decade. Uh, they've been out for seven, this is the eighth year. So I would say that's probably been the biggest innovation. Um, there's a lot of tools, of course, that have come out, but that's, that's the standout, I would say. That's, and why it's so controversial as well. It's very polarizing among the beekeeping community. So uh, that would be a standout. What's your favorite invention ever? Come on. My favorite <laughs> invention ever, I'm gonna have to say the Camara which means room and camera obscura was a darkened room and that's the basis for the camera so i'm gonna have to say as far as inventions go they're useful to me i'm sure there are a lot of practical things out there but when it comes to art and uh, bringing soul to your life and the ability to capture people and for future generations to look back on it's gonna have to be the camera it's gonna have to be photography cool what's something people may not know about you Something people may not know about me is that uh, I always wanted to be a herpetologist. So from the time I was in second grade, I talked about snakes, which is orpheology, and I always wanted to know about reptiles and amphibians, and I knew right up until I was a senior in high school that that's exactly what I was going to do for a living, is be a herpetologist. If someone is just getting started in beekeeping, what are two pieces of advice you'd give them? Well, the first piece of advice, if you're starting out with beekeeping, is you want to memorize this YouTube channel. It's called Frederick Dunn. You want to go there every day and uh, walk upon the knowledge that's delivered there in your beekeeping. But if, you, if you're going to be a beekeeper, I would say don't rush into buying a bunch of equipment. Don't get any bees yet. Find out what bees are about, and as we mentioned earlier already, uh, go and find out if you like being around bees in someone's apiary. Get next to a beehive and listen to the people that keep them and find out if that's something that you really want to do in the long term. It's not something that you want to do all of a sudden spur of the moment. You saw a documentary, I want to help bees, I want to keep bees. Next thing you know, the box is delivered. Knowledge first, practical applications last. Do you have a family? Yes, I do. Next question. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm married, and I uh, actually met my wife while I was in the Navy. We're both retired, and uh, we have four kids, and we have, let me see, four grandchildren as well. So three sons and a daughter. The daughter is the most work of all of them, although I wouldn't share that with anybody beyond the two of us. <laughs> awesome. All right, what's your preferred stock of bees? Preferred stock of bees? Um, well, I cycle back my own genetics, so those that are northern, hardy, kind of hybrid stock would be my first choice right now. And those, of course, that demonstrate the grooming and the varroa sensitive traits. So when I need to refresh my stock, I go to uh, Bee Weaver from Daniel Weaver in Nova Soda, Texas. Um, I'm trying out, this year I'm trying out some carniolans from Better Bee. So we're going to find out and see what's going on with those, but uh, if I had to pick, uh, the bee weaver, I started off my first 10 years uh, treatment free. So I had very low mite counts with those. Uh, they also did not produce a huge amount of honey up here in uh, the northeastern United States. Uh, and since honey isn't what I was after, I was much more interested in their ability to kind of fend for themselves. And, uh, but then I did, you know, turn over to organic treatments. And so uh, now I'm cycling back my own stock after over 17 years of keeping bees. So uh, I'm actually pretty good right now as far as varroa controls and uh, getting the results from my bees that I need. And uh, so I don't really have a, a trade name stock or a race of bees that I would specifically target right now, but I still would go with uh, Bee Weaver if I needed to buy in a queen just because I want to support the breeders that are doing things like they are with treatment free for so many, um, so many years now. So, what's one thing you think most bee beekeepers miss today? Something they miss, yeah. something they get wrong, Correct. or okay. Uh, I think a lot of beekeepers today, and we're talking specifically backyard beekeepers. The commercial end of things is totally different. Uh, I think a lot of people start out with bees and think that they're going to have a holistic approach to beekeeping, that they're just going to put them out in their yard, put them into a hive, and then uh, just let them go and enjoy the fact that they're out there. And beekeeping today, unfortunately, is not like that. You have to actively understand what's going on with your bees in your beehive. 
you need to become educated about the things that can go wrong with them because you're not operating with your bees in isolation. So the things that you do with your bees, if you don't take care of them, and there were, for example, some kind of brood disease that fired up in your hive, it would spread around to other beekeepers as well. So I think one of the biggest shortfalls for brand new beekeepers is that you can just be completely holistic, hands off, park your bees, and then reap the wards later. There's so much more to it than that. So please keep, maintain, and understand your bees. That's good. All right, for the last few questions, we asked our audience to share some of their questions for you. Not really. So from Mark B, do you have any unexpected hobbies other than photography? Unexpected hobbies? Um, I don't know what the term unexpected means, but I'm a, I'm a fine artist also, so I'm an oil painter. And uh, something else people may not know about me is there's a naval base in Chicago, Illinois called Great Lakes. And I have maritime paintings there that are part of the historic register. So I'm a maritime painter and I also do oil painting of portraits of people. And uh, that of course led to photography and other things, but that's something that people would be surprised to know. Okay, Jason Crook from Bohemia Apiaries yeah. really wants to know, does honey last forever? You know what? He he already knows my answer to that. So we talked about that in Mythbusters with his uh, video on that. And uh, there is a myth out there. And the first question I ask back to people that want to know that is why do you need that to be true? Why do you need to think that honey could be 3,000 years old or even 5,000 years old and still be edible? First of all, that honey that people describe that say, for example, it should be in the Cairo Museum because it was part of King Tut's tomb, the most frequently cycled story. Um, and the problem is there is no honey that's still viable and edible and it's not in the archives and they can't trace back to who the archeologists were that took it out, tasted it and made that statement. But yet it's one of those rumors that just continues to go. But what I would uh, suggest to people is that honey that you're collecting now is a bad backyard beekeeper is going to be good for the rest of your life. That's a safe bet. Betsy Coy wants to know, what is the best prank your wife has ever played on you? My wife's no good at pranks. Um, so I prank my wife, so that may come from that. I like to startle her and scare her and uh, do things. You know, she's never got one up on me, I'm sorry to say. I mean, I'm happy to have someone prank me, but I'm just, let's face it, I'm too aware of my environment. <laughs> All right, the last question from Kevin Monfell at Bee Bum. If a chicken and a half laid an egg and a half in a day and a half, how many eggs would a rooster lay in a full day? Zero, roosters don't lay eggs. Can't get anything past this guy. It's All like right. how much dirt is in a hole three feet wide, six feet long, and two feet deep. <laughs> no, it's a hole. Okay. You got it. <laughs> you got it. All right, Fred, that was it. Appreciate the time. We'll let you get back to your photography. Sure. Thanks a lot, and great having you out here. Thanks for visiting. Thanks, Fred. Yep. Yeah.